Hey, this is Christian Buckley with another uh, post Collab Talk Tweet Jam interview. I'm here today with uh, John. And John, thanks for joining. Hey, no problem. It's the jam after the jam. Of course, we're, we'll be jamming here. And of course, <laughs> were you listening to the official soundtrack by chance? I, <laughs> I like do not believe I was. No. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, so why don't you, John? I want you to introduce yourself, and then we'll uh, we'll jump into things. Sure. Uh, John Peluso. I've uh, been in the, the Microsoft Collab space here. Uh, let's see. I built my first SharePoint 2003 server uh, in 2003. So that, that's that been a while. Uh, the chief product officer for AvPoint and a Microsoft regional director. I used to consider myself kind of not one of the old timers because I didn't get involved into SharePoint until 2005. And yeah. I felt like I was kind of a late start <laughs> to that. And now, you know, one of the, the old timers. We I think we decided today, especially those of us that are more in the middle age, the older than a lot of the community, to refer to ourselves as the elders of the internet. I think yes. we're taking that title. I always feel good when I walk into a conference room and there's a there's a SharePoint person on the other side of the table. Yeah. So they they have some well it's it's like it's always been that way where having people that have the infrastructure background you could be talking about software you could be talking about you know, designing a new user interface but when you have somebody that understands the pipes uh, the bowels of the system someone has who has lived through the pain let's right. just say that <laughs> in, in that perspective is always good to have well thanks yeah. so well today you know this was it's always the annual this is the biggest collab talk tweet jam of the year. We just closed out now our ninth year of running these. So January will be the 10th anniversary of the, the launch of this. And so we had, I don't know how many people were on the panel. There were like 70, 75 people. Uh, and so answers were just flying by. It went very quickly. Um, but it's always around, you know, kind of the, the summary of the year behind us and predictions for the year ahead. And so, yeah. of course, there was some COVID talk and work from home stuff, but we I think there were still some nuggets that are with them. We're going to go comb through the data. Um, Tigraph is a great sponsor, and AppPoint now is a sponsor of these uh, monthly uh, tweet jams. Tigraph Tools, and I'll provide the link. It'll be in the blog post as well. People should go take a look. If you missed the tweet jam, what's great is every single tweet in order, time stamped. You can scroll through anybody that used the collab talk hashtag in this hour will be captured on that. And so you can literally just scroll back through all of them. So I think I'm going to need to need it to, to keep track of, of what, what the heck even I was saying. Well, that's the fun thing is that people were at saying, it's like, well, what did I predict last year or two years ago? And they're like, Christian, do you have that data of what I predicted? I'm like, go do your <laughs> own research. Search Twitter saves all of it. It's all there. You can go and do a complex search query on Twitter and find everything that you said in you know December of uh, 2019 as part of the the tweet jam. So, well, let's jump into this with question number unlimited one. retention there on Twitter. Yes, unlimited correct. Retention. Well, that's unfortunate for some people. That's why it keeps making news. Like, well, you tweeted back in 2008. You know, so. permanent record. Yep. Yep. Uh, all right, so uh, the question number one says, in your opinion, what was the biggest news for Microsoft 365 this year? So kind of your, what are your biggest takeaways? I mean, I think you saw it, right? You saw it in the posts. Um, I think my post was almost to the letter, the same as someone else's. Um, you know, it's it's the adoption, it's the surge. Um, the, uh, the link I tossed out there was the 115 million daily active users in teams i think it it was it was you know uh the move from i'm looking into it we're sort of we've got one foot in the water i i literally talked to uh, a gentleman in, at an organization he was in the security team he said they had planned their teams roll out for six months slowly over six months um he went on vacation on friday he came back monday and teams had been rolled out to the entire organization yeah. and i don't think that's an uncommon story given what i've heard you know, it's another, I think along those same lines, I've done a number of interviews with uh, some fellow MVPs, but some uh, uh, just uh, some very large Microsoft customers out there that were surprised at how prepared they were for work mm. from home because they had already the year prior, yep. you know, leading up to this, had been moving over towards teams yep. and, and to be able to support this. And now they were... Still, the, in fact, one of the, the companies I interviewed out of the UK, 
Um, it, it's a it's a big company that Microsoft uh, you know highlights a lot. They had no plans. They were one of these companies that said, no, we can never do work from home. And yeah. so they were doing that rollout, but we're still in the office. And then they went completely 100% work from home yeah. and said, hey, at, even after this, when we open back up, we can do this. We can have, yeah. you know, this variant work schedule. You know. Yeah, I think I think the validity of it, right? So so the, the urgency of it was one thing, but I think what proved out I see this internally at point and and I think I've seen it at other customers too, is exactly what you're saying. This is a sustainable model. It's not just a reaction and and sure, you know, we'll spend more time in the office. We'll have much more face to face meetings. That for me was the biggest the biggest downside was was the face to face meetings, the conferences. I mean, Microsoft did a fantastic job and others did organizing, you know, virtual events, but that's there's just no comparison, I don't think. Well, yeah. we'll and we'll talk. We got a question on the community, the activities yeah. inside of it, because yeah, you're right. There's, I think there's a lot to talk about there. But yeah. you know what I think is interesting? The trend that's been happening again prior to COVID was that even if you, I've been working from home for for a decade, but even when I've been visiting customer sites and uh, you know companies in Microsoft and participate in a meeting, you have like a third of the people that aren't even there. They're already dialing in like that was yep. already happening yeah uh and, and so yeah that's a it, it's 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 great to see that shift in thinking i've been working in collaboration technology most of my career in fact back when i was working with a, another technology platform back in 2001 um and we deployed a hosted collaboration solution and here we were a company that's building this technology to allow people to remotely collaborate and the policy was no work from home yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so and so we would we would sit in our cubes and not go into a conference room and do all of our meetings with headphones in our cubes. Yeah. Yeah. And we're like, why did I drive into the office? Exactly. You know, you, you know what? I mean, I think um, and this is probably we're I'm taking you off track here, but I was surprised and at point is a team shop. Um, and we had you know, we, we pretty much adopted um, soon after the preview came out. So, so we, we've been at it for a while, but it was amazing to me how much, um, camaraderie and social interaction you can have, right? Even dumb stuff, you know, the stickers, making your own memes, doing things like that, um, keeps, it, it's the thing that people don't normally think about, but, you know, when you have a widely dispersed team, especially, uh, you know, um, when we're home all the time, uh, it was it was uh, pretty amazing to me how 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 connected you can feel. Yeah, no, agreed. Uh, I mean, we do this. We have a family chat. It's not in Teams, um, but so I've got my four adult children, and uh, two of which are married. And um, you know, so we we have kind of a running uh, uh, chat that's happening, and the stickers and the sharing of the memes. Oh yeah, stuff is it's an important part of that. Mike's team has some conversations where there's never a word. It's always just memes and gifts floating back and forth. Right. Uh, that's the way to make important business decisions these absolutely, days. Absolutely. Absolutely. Finding that appropriate meme from <laughs> the IT crowd or, yes. or or the office or Arrested Development. Yeah. Uh, well, so question number two. So, how has your out or has your outlook yeah. on Microsoft technology changed this past year? Why or why not? So I think this year, uh, let's see, um, what I said in the in the tweet jam, I think is probably the 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 most. On the whole, no. On balance, I think we're seeing execution of a strategy that was put in place a long time ago. And so I think you know um, the evolution of Teams, Teams as kind of the primary place we're going to land end users in the Office 365 service. Um, the importance of um, you know, citizen development, things like that. These are these are seeds that were planted a while ago. And so, you know, the, the one thing I agree with that I saw some people saying was um, it was nice to see operationally Microsoft be able to support the massive load that they that they have. And, you know, it's it's you know, glib to make comments about, you know, your call dropping or audio quality. But I think it's been absolutely amazing for a service that's as young, really, as Teams to be able to support that kind of growth. So so 
if there was anything surprising to me, um, I think it was that, and and it was a pleasant surprise. I am noticing that you know part of what allow is allowing Microsoft to create these experiences as quickly as they are is that they have a lot of these ready-made components, right? You have fantastic file storage and, and file management in SharePoint. You have a really good identity model in Azure AD. Um, Teams obviously brings the persistent chat model, but it can depend on these other services. Um, and, and I think that that has been a, a benefit. I think we're starting to see some straining happening there as well, though, right? SharePoint is uh, what it is. It's constructed the way it's constructed. And the thing we constantly say to some of our customers is, remember, SharePoint is still SharePoint. It's not just Teams file storage. So if you have folks that are doing some crazy stuff, you can create quite a bit of a mess for yourself. And if you look at things like private channels, they, I think they came out um, end of last year, mm -hmm. um, but really you know, moving into mainstream adoption this year, the fact that every private channel gets its own SharePoint site collection, you know, the fact that Microsoft raised the maximum site collection limit from 500,000 to 2 million this year, you know, gives us a sense of some of this stuff. So I think, you know, the, the same thing that has worked uh, in favor, um, it'll be interesting to see over the next year how and if these things start to clash a little. Teams has to innovate. It has to move very quickly. Can these other services keep up in the changes that they need to make? Um, in order to support teams, or, do, or or does teams do more on their own? Um, that that'll be interesting to see. Yeah, ag agreed. I think it's uh, there. There's a lot to go and do. It's nice to uh, uh, to see the rapid pace of innovation f on the front end and a lot of the capabilities that people want. Um, but I think there are a number of areas. I mean, people have talked about um, you know limitations of the current Teams desktop application. It's a great example of that. Yep, and absolutely. It's performance and that kind of thing. The uh, solving some of these problems, which uh, you know, I would say can honestly say since the launch of Teams, we've talked about the multi-tenant login issue and moving, yep. like you know, things like that. That the yep. some of the limitations that were held to because of the desktop. A application that yeah. you don't have with the mobile app, for for yeah. example. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, I cool. think if you yeah, if you also look at the complexity of because we've based teams on Office 365 groups, there is naturally now this organizational component. I'm seeing in our own usage, and I'm sure others are seeing it too. There's a team, we should be communicating in the team, but now this chat spawned over here. Like it's easy for things to get away. Why can I have an urgent setting on a chat message, but not in a channel message? That's Why can I pop out a chat message? John, that's a perfect a segue. Let's talk more about this. For question three was, has the continued growth of Microsoft Teams, SharePoint, and Power Platform altered how you and your customers think about collaboration? That's a great example. Uh, you know, we yeah. had, some people are aware of this, uh, that there's a, uh, you know, as MVPs and RDs, we had access to, there was a Teams airlift, the, the last one, the in-person one last year. And that was a great opportunity. I sat down with uh, members of the engineering team at Microsoft that owned the chat capability, not the yep. conversations in Teams, but you know the chat capability. And I talked about, well, why is, for example, why is the chat technology when I chat in Yammer different from that when I chat in Teams, where I chat anywhere else that chat is available? Why is that not the same technology that sits across all of those things and then wherever it's managed, whether it's stored in Exchange or SharePoint or some other, th like whatever, let's consolidate that. You see some movement of those, like uh, like Yammer storage moving across, stream storage moving over to SharePoint OneDrive. I mean, you're seeing some of those movements. I think chat is still uh, you know, a, a problem area as far as the storage and the story across those. But for that, that purpose, and this uh, kind of gets to my point is, you know, we started seeing, it, it all comes down to search. If I go and search on a topic, a project that I own in my company, it's associated with a group that could be associated with a number of SharePoint and Teams locations and Yammer communities, whatever it is, I'm going to go search in one place and find artifacts across all of those things. And that's not true today. That's not possible. Yeah, I, I think that's that's true. Um by having so many more places to have these conversations, even with the same people, right? There is some fatigue. I know I feel it of where was that 
message? <laughs> where did I go? Where do I reply to that? Now, um, obviously, uh, at that point, we're lucky enough to be part of some of the, the technology adoption programs for teams. And there's certainly some some exciting things that we've seen hinted at. So I think there's there's things to come that are going to help with this. Um, but there is no doubt that uh, there are times when I I log on in the morning and say, I know that this conversation happened. I just can't find my way back there. I think right. we're going to get there. Or, or you heard the notification somewhere. Yeah. So I have my desktop and my two giant monitors, and I have my work laptop next to me and my phone, and there was a ding, and I was in the middle of a conversation. <laughs> I don't know where the ding came from, and I'm looking across different things. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you know that your adoption of Teams is uh, is on target when you have to turn the sound of the notification off on your phone because it otherwise it just rings every two seconds. Um, and and mute conversation is is quite a useful thing. That's like a default action now when joining a new uh, you know a, a new team or is to instantly mute the conversation unless I'm active within it and I need to be listening for that. I have to go and mute the sounds, the pop-ups, the, the, all of those things. So I think, I think that statement there, um, and I know there's a, there's a, there's a question on this as well. Like there's a lot of stuff here that happened very quickly, right? So this rapid adoption that we've been talking about, yeah, it's important, but there's a lot of detail here. And I think that there needs to be amongst, you know, um, uh, both Microsoft and, and the, the user body, you know, this is not something that people will always figure out on their own. We had a we had a situation internally where um, someone created a new team, they created a new channel in that team, and and it turned out to be a really important channel. It was about naming of a new product and you know using the technology right in that channel to structure a vote, and people voted. The problem was when they added the channel, they didn't show it for all uh, members of the team. And so many people didn't know that this channel existed. And so these are the things, the, the, the hitting your shins on the coffee table stuff that, you know, the technology is so new. Uh, it's important. I think, the, the, you know, the work that you've been doing around community um, and getting the word out is important. Um, but, uh, you know, this is it's 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 not all magic. Right. There needs to be work. And I think that's where Microsoft has done a really good job with especially the team's um, uh, team within Microsoft, trying to get that adoption, uh, those adoption resources out there. The, you know, some of the 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 um, the ready-made resources and, and things like that, that they've been working on. I think it would be really, really valuable. It just has to be done. It has to be executed on. Well, you know, uh, the, and a lot of, I mean, you know this too, for, as a SharePoint person, that we've said this for years that a lot of what uh, really helped grow and make the SharePoint community so strong was the lack of documentation and help coming out of Microsoft. Absolutely. We helped each other. And yeah. with the hiring of so many MVPs and community experts uh, you know, into Microsoft who said, yeah. we have to fix this problem. And I'll point to like Caruana Gatimu is a great Absolutely. example. Absolutely. She, I mean, we, so we've been friends. She, she and I uh, uh, started SharePoint Saturday Los Angeles together back in 2010. And, and, and with all that, when she joined, I mean, she just saw that as a gaping hole and, and yeah. has been driving on that adoption and enablement uh, uh, topic. Yeah. And so yeah. it's, it's not surprising when you see people that live through it and railed against this aspect of Microsoft um, that are going inside and, and are adamant about fixing that problem. Yeah. Learning great. pathways, man. If you don't know about learning pathways, go learn about it because oh, yeah. uh, it's right there for you. Well, speaking of community, so question four was, with everything that's happened with uh, due to COVID-19 and the evolution of Microsoft 365, what has been the impact to your local user group and community? Yeah, I think uh, this has been the, the, the real negative for me. I think that, you know, Again, uh, small, large, we've seen everyone try to pivot to these these remote events. And I don't know, you know, there's operational challenges to doing that, of course. Um, um, but I, it's there's just a fatigue, right? I mean, there's such a thing as remote meeting fatigue. And uh, I know myself, I, you mentioned Airlift last year. That was one of the most important uh, events for me of the year. Yeah. Uh, I learned things at that event that, you know, fueled <laughs> tasks and goals for myself for 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 almost 12 months. Um, this year, unfortunately, the event was all virtual. And, and I out. found. 
Yeah, and I found myself having a really hard time, even though I couldn't imagine what they could have done better to try to do it. Um, but there's just something that gets lost there. So I think the the, the fatigue of these remote events and the lack of, of real interpersonal um, uh, communication, being able to pull someone to the side and have a quick chat with them, you know, being able, you know, being forced. I think it's also a self-discipline thing. Right. Yeah. It's easy to blow something off when it's remote as opposed to in person where you've already made the commitment to be there. Right. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's hard to do that. I think even with uh, so you know the Microsoft community stuff, I mean, the local user group stuff and we're it's the exact same scenario. We're finding it's we're competing that now where you have there's there's something going on almost every single day somewhere in the world. And you're able to, like, I can dial in at midnight my time if I'm end of my work day, you know, uh, and, and, and catch sessions that are happening in India uh, at, a, at a, an event, an online event. Uh, and so there's constantly, there's speaking opportunities. So to go and yeah. do a, essentially a, you know, a giant webinar and participate. But us as a local user group here where I am in Utah, we, I mean, we're just kind of saying, well, we've done, this would have been our 10th. February would have been our 10th annual event and we've canceled it for February. We're hoping to do an in-person or hybrid event in August. Um, but you know, we're, we're just saying, you know, it doesn't make sense for us to go and compete and pull in speakers where there's another, a Southern California event happening yeah. the week prior to that. And, yeah. and it's like, it just, just doesn't make any sense. I don't know that we're really providing value. We'll go support, yeah. participate in those other events and push people towards that yeah. but it's it's just kind of changed the it's need interesting so right it's the, and this happens anytime there's this kind of democratization right the the barrier to entry to having an event is lower when it's yeah. virtual right the expense is lower right. um, and so while that is fantastic <laughs> from a you know democratization standpoint on some level yes there the air where's the air for you know the next event i don't know right yeah, so I'm I'm a music collector, so I understand this problem. Like when eBay was new, it was fantastic. Was suddenly I would find items that I've been searching for for years, and fast forward five six years later, those items that were I was spending hundreds of dollars on were for sale for you know twenty bucks and multiple items there with no bids because yeah. everybody just flooded it. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you have a bit of that. There's a great blog post. I know that you've probably seen it that uh, Mark Rackley wrote about um, not recording um, yes. some sessions and protecting yeah. the IP of the speakers. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Anyway, that's who, who amongst us hasn't seen our slide in different colors on some other presentation? <laughs> right, right. Well, uh, question number five. Uh, so getting back into the products, uh, what three features available now are publicly announced are having or will have the biggest impact in 2021? Ah, uh, yeah, this is such a hard one because it's so it's so perspective based, right? Um, I think, I mean, so so I'll I'll go from my personal perspective. Yeah, right? that's what I want. You know, yeah. That's the only thing I can I can do, right? So I think that you know the the uh, finally the introduction of a con of a real conversation migration API with this import API that Microsoft uh, Teams is, is creating. It's in preview now. Um, finally gives us a, a real quality way to do uh, migrations into Teams where you're coming from a, some other platform with conversations. Um, up until this API, uh, because of the, the ability to support conversation level, post level, um, um, API calls. Microsoft really tamped down on on an ISV like us being able to to give you full fidelity or near full fidelity um, uh, live conversations. So if you were coming from Slack, you were coming from another tenant in Office 365. Um, best we could do is basically give you a historical copy in a document. Right. You archive it and you make it searchable. Right. Yeah, yep. but being able to play that back um, uh, with full with full fidelity, which is what this API promises, there's definitely it's not going to be the right thing for every situation. There's some real requirements around it. Um, it doesn't do very well with uh, incremental updates over time. Um, but as a as a way to, to to really capture that that information that was in your other tenant or in your Slack 
uh, channel and move it to Teams. It is a game changer on that one. And I know there's been lots of organizations asking for this one. You know, that's similar to conversations a few years back about moving an in-state workflow and yep. be able to start that up again. Same same issue where you almost need to use like Teams now has the archive uh, yep. function and it's, I mean, it's limited in its capability, but essentially freezing things so you get things yep. to quiet down. And then when you do the move, there's less chance that in between that, yeah. that migration, that stuff happened. Yeah, yeah. You know, and uh, yeah. so it makes it a cleaner move. move. So yeah, it'll be interesting yeah. to take a look at yeah. that. I think also private channels. Um, again, that was that was very tail end of last year, but really this year is when we first started. And very controversial. People using it. Super yeah. controversial, mostly because uh, SharePoint people like to gripe a little bit, well, uh, you know. So but also, we didn't know, to be fair to the community on that, we we yeah. really didn't know how Microsoft would actually architect a solution. We talked about, we heard yeah. about it as MVPs, but yeah. they, they had a lot of decisions. They got some of that initial feedback yeah. of what it would actually look like. And I actually, I, I, I held back on my commentary. I'm like, we need to see what it looks like. Yeah. You know? I, I, I blogged on this at the time, but I... I, I understand why there was such controversy there. Um, the the separate SharePoint site, the way that membership is managed, you know, the loose connection <laughs> sometimes uh, between the moving parts. I understand all of the controversy there, but I I continue to say that I think at, at every stage they did make the right decision. The of all the options that were available to them, this was the best given the requirements. But again, I think it goes back to that first uh, thing that I was talking about, or the second thing I was talking about, you do see some of the strain, right? SharePoint was built to be its own thing, right? It's a site is a site. And now we have this, you know, concept of there's multiple sites associated with a single working group. Um, so, so I think private channels are really important. Um, I think we still need more flexibility than we have. So, you know, uh, we'll see what happens there. Uh, but that's the first one where, gosh, why do I have to now have a separate team just to talk to these management people, right? When every other bit of our department business is happening in this team. Right. Um, so I think I thought that was interesting too. And obviously from a competitive standpoint, it was a must do. I think I think by a factor of two private channels was the most requested uh, feature in, in yep. Teams user voice. Yeah. Right. Well, the one thing I will I'll add in there, I mean, there's a few other items that I, or personal uh, uh, comments as well, but the probably the biggest thing I think will have a huge impact. Still, a lot of work to do, but is uh, uh, task management. Uh, yes, I think oh, for sure. The, we started to see the aggregation, so to do and planner, and there's still disconnects with project, um, whether project online uh, or or project desktop. Uh, but we're to to see integration between deeper integration with Outlook, and there's new Outlook on the web capabilities. Uh, and, and a lot of people that that create generate tasks out of OneNote, and yep. want to see that map across not just to Outlook but into To Do and Planner and the yeah. relationships there. I think uh, there there's a lot of uh, room for movement. There's, so I, there's I got something into the space. I got yeah. into the, the information management space through project management technology. So yep. it's something that I still think is so critical. That, that Microsoft owns all of these important tools, and yet no one dominates the yeah. project management technology space, yeah. not even Microsoft. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, and even the small scale, right, the day-to-day. -day. You mentioned the integration. I think the the tasks uh, by planner app that's in Teams now is, is you know, fundamentally a, a, an amazingly good thing yep. to try to bring the, 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 the pieces together. I know for a fact uh, that my group has moved off to Doist, onto To Do and Planner because we now finally have the things we need to do that kind of lightweight task management. The right. dark horse nobody's thinking about, but I think about it. The To Do APIs are out, so being able to create my own lists for my application in To Do, being able to create tasks programmatically from a different application, that's something that I think is going to be really important. Um, and it, it's kind of not a lot of fanfare, right, amongst the other things, but but we're already looking at it and saying, hmm, you know, how far down the line in task management do I want to go in my own application versus, 
just going ahead and feeding a task into to do, which will feed it into Teams by extension and connects it to this whole ecosystem. Well, it, like I said, there's a lot of opportunity there. That's a whole topic in and of itself. We've done tweet jams on task yep. management topics. In fact, yep. this beginning of this year, I think January, February of, of this year, we did that. But anyway, well, let's, uh, so moving along, question six. What are your predictions for Microsoft 365 and related technologies in 2021 and beyond? Obviously, hashtag no leaks. Um, <laughs> that's, that's the hard part, right? That's, that's that the hardest the hard part. Because <laughs> I'm trying to, I always, I, I, I get into that as well, where like, I don't want to say something like, where did I have that conversation? Was that a off the record one-on-one -on -one with the Microsoft person? Was that an official uh, MVP, yeah. NDA discussion? Or was that public? And so I'll have to go and look like, yeah. oh, I see there is a blog post. I could talk about that. I always uh, bing it with Google before I uh, before I do any <laughs> predictions. <laughs> you, that's right. <laughs> the official sponsor of, of Google search, Bing. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, yeah, so, so prediction. So I think that, you know, number one, um, not a surprise, right? Some of these changes are, are here to stay. Right. So uh, once you get users in, uh, you're not going to get them out. You can't put the genie back in the bottle. Right. So I think that um, whether or not the work from home model stays consistent, I think that that um, you will see uh, the technologies that were necessary and implemented during um, the lockdowns. They're going to continue. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Right. Um, I. I am hoping that you'll see some consolidation. I do believe you'll see some consolidation um, uh, with as many people are, are, are that, that have access to Teams now. It, it amazes me that that some of these folks are still okay. But we do meetings in in WebEx, and we do this over in this thing, and oh, we have this for instant messaging. I had a customer that was that was having trouble because their uh, their meeting invitations sent from Teams don't show up right in their Gmail, and it's like. What are we doing here, right? So I think I think that that this will finally be the year. Now that the technology is in front of everybody, where people outside of the inside start to really see, oh, Office three sixty five is not a product. It's not a thing that I use just like I use this, right? It is intended to be my Microsoft Office of the modern age, right? Um, People still use, I can remember, I'm old enough to remember people still using Lotus 1, 2, 3, right? Even though they owned Microsoft Word. But once Office came out and really became a thing and packaged together, right? Uh, people f realized fairly quickly um, that I didn't need to go buy that other product. I think we're going to see a lot of consolidation um, I'll just uh, say across that I, I'm, services. I'm still a little bit upset about the, the move of Excel away from the proprietary macro language because I was an expert. Uh, what was that 92 90, 91 92 yeah yeah they moved your cheese that's for sure no, that's that's right uh well last question uh and this is always fun to go back and look at the responses to this uh yeah. if you give one piece of advice to microsoft leadership and or product teams regarding microsoft 365 what would it be so i I'll quickly move through the answer I gave in the jam, and then I'll and I'll get to my next one. Um, the the one I gave in the jam, I have to beat the ISV drum, right? Just because of that's who we are as a uh, you know as an organization. Uh, companies are going to need last mile support, right? And a lot of times that is complementary products. So when when you know a new technology comes out. When you know we're looking at things like uh, you know innovative new technologies in Office 365 sensitivity labels at the site group and team level, great. But I don't yet have the ability to have the same level of interaction uh, with that as first party. Um, the API set is not fully built out for that. So as customers come and knock on the door and say, "How you know? Hey, I really want to leverage this technology." Um, they, you know, they're looking for ways to operationalize that. Microsoft has done a very good job at the citizen developer level, at the PowerShell level, I think, in allowing people to do this. Um, but I think that, that there needs to be a, a constant focus that they need to enable ISV partners to, to build around this functionality. It's, it's critical. The Microsoft Teams team has been fantastic at this. The 
Graph API team, right? It's it's amazing to see the work that's being done there by our friend uh, Jeremy Thake and others. He's building quite a team there. Um, but I think across all the products, it's it's a really really important thing. Now here's my real beef, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I saw this one come up. Um, listen, the winds of change blow. We know that we're in a different world. When we say we're going to do something, six months later, market conditions can change. We may change our minds. Um, but I do think that at times uh, we've seen large announcements at major conferences that either don't come out for a year. I saw the same feature demonstrated at two consecutive Ignites. Yeah. Right. And then when the feature came out, it was different than it had been demonstrated twice. So I think there needs to be transparency. Again, some are better than others at this. There needs to be transparency because organizations need to plan, especially when when the features affect things like security, compliance. Um, you know, and there's a few examples of this. I think unified labeling was once going to be retention and security. And then for really good reasons, they changed their mind. But they didn't make that message really clear that they changed their mind. Right you now. Well, yeah, and that's a, that's a, a difficult one because it, you know when uh, w- when Jeff Taper moved back into his role and we did the the, the May the fifth event, you know, um, uh, May fifth event, and and uh, kind of talked about the future and and even at some of the MVP summits, so behind the scenes, and he said, look, we're going to err on the side of oversharing on this. We're going to yep. tell you things that this is what we're thinking. It may not be part of the forum or roadmap, but let's have a discussion. Yep. So there was this transparency. And they they also I'm, and I'm not going to quote uh, you know a paraphrase uh, uh, Jeff I, I don't, or or if somebody else made the statement said you know we're <laughs> really trying to get better about not announcing things that are so far out and, and above that that those kinds of changes won't happen and I think there was an effort for several years to try and do that be more transparent to only talk about things that they know were going to happen and they're sure of yeah. and otherwise be transparent about we're yep. thinking about this let's get some feedback from the community the mvps and rds and things out there where now they are doing more of the in the future and hey we see this and it's getting back to what almost what microsoft was doing 15 20 years ago and talking to this big picture stuff that's out there and and then uh, uh, you're wanting to have for these major events a big surprise moment yeah. I like yeah. the no surprise moments. Yeah. Um, you, you know, it, it, yeah. yeah, maybe you get more butts and seats for an event by. I, I, I'm all about them. all of it, right? I'm all about all of it. I just think that the the, the and and I personally, I like the oversharing, right? I like that model. I like being able to see what may come. I think if you can pull it off, right? If you can generally hit your timelines, if right. you can have a mechanism to be crystal clear um, when those plans change. Um, and I don't even need to know why they changed, right? It's nice, but I don't need to know. But just knowing that the plans have changed or that something is under delay. Um, again, sometimes better than others, uh, but I think that's really important. And in part, it's a it's a psychological thing. We have, for good and for bad, we've given up control of our own release cycles, of our own you know, um, uh, decisions uh, in some cases about if and when we're going to, you know, get a new technology. And so there needs to be uh, a way to make the entire organization feel comfortable about that. And so I think that's the other thing is, you know, transparency on the back end. There's transparency on the front end is great, right? Oh, look at all these cool things we're going to do. But transparency on the back end, hey, here's why we didn't do it. I'm sure there's a good reason. I think the sensitivity label uh, or the um, unified labeling one was the perfect one. There's a really good reason why they, they didn't follow through on the original vision that was positioned. That's cool, right? Just make sure it's it's well known, right? Agreed. Well, John, really appreciate uh, the the follow up. Uh, I know I've, I've uh, now sucked up almost two hours of your day today, but <laughs> I'll let you get back into it. But uh, really appreciate your, your uh, participation. And again, for everybody that's that's watching, so we're uh, uh, you know again closing out the ninth year of doing monthly uh, tweet jams. You can always find us out on Twitter. Anybody can participate. It's on Twitter. It's wide open using the collab talk hashtag. And uh, these events that are sponsored now by uh, by AppPoint and Tigraph, and really appreciate the support, continued support, and we'll be back 
in late January with the next one. So hope to see you there. All right. Thanks, Christian. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, everybody. Talk to you later.